Come in, you guys. And just grab a seat there. So it's been almost six months since the Hong Kong protest started with escalating violence and no end in sight. What's your take on this? I'm very sympathetic to the protesters' cause. Um, I support the five demands. I don't support violence from both sides, um, including the protesters. But I do think that that shouldn't overshadow the overall cause that they're asking for. Because I'm from Hong Kong and just seeing the city like fall apart like this, it's, it's pretty sad. But at the same time, I do think a lot of the protesters, it's just, they feel very frustrated that, you know, the government wouldn't listen to them. I agree with some of the demands, like the government should be more responsive to the citizens, but I don't agree with uh, violence and don't agree with uh, people asking for the police to like release all of the violent protesters. And it's really heart-wrenching to see the city come to this and see young people who are not in school and spending a lot of their days like out there protesting and uh, having violence from both sides just doesn't help with the entire issue. You know, some protesters think that the means justify the end, you know, that the violence needs to happen for their five demands to be met. Is that the only way that that can happen? Is there another way that they can just stand down and still get their five demands met? Well, I think this really goes to the question of what the people, or how much legitimacy the people give to the existing system. If they think that the entire system is entirely broken and the, gov the Hong Kong government isn't even responsive, doesn't actually serve their interests, has another agenda, then like, I think for them, violence is the only way. Yeah, and I think the protesters are definitely provoking yeah, response from, the, from, the, uh, from the, from mm -hmm. the like, mm -hmm. Chinese government, because they know precisely that China is not likely to send troops or to have any mm -hmm. like, hard measures on Hong Kong because China right now is facing so much international pressure with yeah. like the trade war and the slowing down of the economy. I think the government actively used kind of like a wait and see strategy because they're waiting for protesters to undermine themselves. It was more or less foreseeable that um, protesters would also resort to violence towards the end. If I was a police officer and you saw people lining up bricks, pulling bricks out of the street, and launching them at you, I'd be pretty terrified no matter what kind of armor or gear you had. Like, And at the same time, like, obviously the protesters are terrified because you see this massive water truck with this blue dye. Like, You're going to be scared on both sides. Um, none of us condone the violence of it, um, but it's hard to say like which side really started the escalation. It's my belief that I think a large part of why the police has been so heavy-handed, I think a lot of it is because of incompetence or just inexperience. And I don't think the Hong Kong government, has, the Hong Kong police has ever had to deal with something like this before. And when they're acting out of fear, then they end up being more um, forceful than they need to be. Um, and that being said, I do think that the police should be held to a higher standard than the protesters. You could say that there are certain extreme situations where police lost control, as you said, where mm -hmm. they feel threatened but set up an independent committee to investigate in these situations. I mean, it's fine to make a mistake, but you should take responsibility. So on that point, you sort of touched on the five demands that now exist. Um, let's backtrack. And what do you think was the root of the protests? I think at the end of the day, a lot of students, uh, a lot of these people that are going out to protest, they feel like, one, they have this identity crisis where they don't want to associate with the rest of China or associate with this idea of being Chinese because they're very proud of where they're from. But also, too, it comes with the economic factors. Uh, they feel like there's not a lot of social mobility. It stems from disillusionment, both mm. politically and economically. And I think, um, you know, as a Chinese person, I was always told, like, if you work hard in school, then you'll succeed. That's not necessarily true. They're, they're working so hard and they go out and try to buy a house and they realize they can't probably will never be able to. Even when they try to exercise their political voice, like the actual quality of life isn't really improving in Hong Kong. I think the widening wealth gap is not a phenomenon unique to Hong Kong. I mean, it's happening here in America, it's happening in Europe. But say in the US, one way to release that kind of like pressure is through democratic elections versus in a place in Hong Kong because there's no democracy. The only way people could express their ideas is to protest, is to go on the, on the street. 
Is that justified though for the protests and the scale of violence that's happening right now? If you look at history, any real revolution starts with some violence, right? The communist revolution in China, I mean, there was definitely a lot of violence involved, but people generally think it was a good thing because Kuomintang was just so unbearable yeah. that we have to have a revolution to change the system. Yeah. My opinion is that if Hong Kong doesn't want to be part of China, just so be it. There's already rumors and there's a lot of misconception that that is what Hong Kong wants. I think it's like the loudest voice in the room is making a case for, they're like speaking for the rest of Hong Kong, like what I presume as a small minority that are going for this Hong Kong independence, mm -hmm. but I don't think that's representative of the majority of the population. So then there's no risk of having full democracy, because even with full democracy, people won't vote to leave China. But like there's you've nothing to lose. Nothing to lose, yeah. Well, you can see from the scaling of violence of the protests and with the rumors and fake news all like favoring the violent protesters, even like make them like a role of model or heroes. It's just you can see how power uh, how the underlying power behind can actually promote people from discredit uh, Hong Kong government and Chinese government. So do you ever feel like, especially now with the protests, it went from essentially anger against Beijing and because they obviously can't really voice that, does it lead down to people? Like, do you feel like you, your identity is under attack? I think we've all seen videos that uh, mainlanders beaten up by the Hong Kong protesters. It's really terrible and the campus has set up the checkpoint because if you want to go inside campus, you have to uh, bring out your bag and people will search your stuff and check out your ID for undercover police. International students are fleeing away and thinking that they are in danger. I mean, that people, quite a number of people, sympathize with the cause. They just feel very disgusted at the racism that Hong Kong people often shows towards Menendez. Um, and I think that's the thing with this protest. It's so multi-layered, it's so much faceted. It's at the same time a political revolution for democracy, a class revolution against the elites, and there's also a lot of nativism and uh, racism involved. Like you can agree with them on one dimension and totally disagree with them on another dimension. Yeah, I, I agree that I think there is a lot of xenophobia in Hong Kong, um, not just towards mainland Chinese, but towards like a lot of, I mean, mostly any other race. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, the yeah Filipinos. Filipinos. Um, um, South, Southeast Asians, it is a lot easier to blame society's problems on another group of people, and I think this is true anywhere, than to like reflect internally and um, consider the fact that you know there are things that, that you need to do yourself to change. You obviously chose to come to the U.S., a country that touts itself for its democracy, and it's also what the Hong Kong protesters say they're pursuing. So what does democracy mean to you? Chinese culture is about stability and the you know, economy, progress, people can live in a good life. That was the government standing for. So that's their policy comes from. And if you are using all those debates, like exactly like the Western countries, it's not efficient. In China, a lot of people think democracy is overrated. They look at the progress that China made in the last 30 or 40 years and they say, you see, we don't have a democracy, but still we are doing so fine. The danger is that a situation like Hong Kong would emerge. A lot of people were making so much money, but then there were all these people who were left out, who thought they couldn't any, in any way let their opinion be heard. It's kind of like a rice cooker, you know, you get pressurized, it gets better pressurized, and then in the end, um, it just turned out into a chaos. A lot of people in the U.S., even though it is a democratic country, you still feel like the rich run the country, the elite run the country. There is no perfect system, but I think at least um, in a country like America, you can voice your opinion without being afraid of, of repercussions. That fear shouldn't exist. I mean, we all are reasonable people. I think we all have really good ideas and opinions, and like we shouldn't be afraid to speak about it.